Everlasting Father, we thank you. Let us pray. Let us pray. Everlasting Father, we thank you. We glorify your name. We bless you for this hour. Thank you for the faith given unto us to learn at your feet. Thank you for the our teacher that we, because we know that you are going to use us, use us for us to be that exalted in Jesus' name. We commit our class to you this morning. Father, come and have your way. Come and take us the control. Come and teach us yourself. My book in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, we will get started. Um, so uh, we've come to this uh, you know, last section about the overcoming life. Uh, we started off with a scriptural foundation for this. Uh, we looked at how um, it is because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, because of that finished work, that we can even think of having a victorious life. We also saw that because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, um, we have a certain identity now. Uh, we have a certain status in him which enables us to uh, live as conquerors um, you know in victory over sin and temptation so uh, we looked at the scriptural foundation of why we are saying that we can walk in victory and then um, we uh, looked at a few practical details uh, we looked at the importance of using the word of god as a weapon in uh, you know gaining victory over sin and temptation uh, we also looked at uh, the um, importance of walking in the spirit and how that helps us you know to maintain our victorious walk so these are all things that uh, we have been looking at today we will focus very specifically on um, one aspect of sin and temptation that we are faced with which is the flesh uh, so um, this would be like you know among the last few chapters in your notes uh, so uh, today we are going to be talking about overcoming the flesh and um, what are, what do we mean by flesh um, you know uh, over here in in the sense that the word is used um, it's talking about the evil desires of our unrenewed mind as well as the um, evil desires of our body so when we are saying flesh in this particular sense, you know, in this uh, scriptural uh, sense, um, uh, we are talking about the evil desires that arise out of our unrenewed mind and also the things that are lurking in our physical bodies. Um, so uh, to use an example, uh, you know, when we, are, when we are talking about the fleshly desires of the unrenewed mind, you know, um, uh, um, God wants us to uh, have a sense of dignity. He wants us to feel um, um, secure in His purpose. He wants us to, you know, um, feel this, um, feel the sense of being called, you know, by Him, and that I have a purpose in my life, and that, uh, you know, if I do it well, sincerely, then He will reward me. So these are all very positive things that God has, you know, uh, programmed us for in our minds. Uh, but an unrenewed mind, you know, uh, starts thinking differently. Um, it it does not just think in terms of being called, uh, in being uh, in, in fulfilling the purpose for which I have been called, uh, in you know in, in in satisfying my Lord and serving Him well. Um, the unrenewed mind starts to give all of this a different angle. It thinks about. Uh, how um, you know uh, I I can become great and humanize. Uh, I start thinking in terms of you know how will this calling benefit me personally. Uh, so I I I start thinking of uh, uh, what can I do you know with this calling uh, which will make me more popular. Uh, I mean uh, so what happens is um, what God wants gets sidelined. And now we are thinking of using this uh, calling of God for our own selfish purposes. So, you know, that's just one example of how something good that has been programmed into our minds, you know, because we all are born with this, right? Even from a young age, you know, we start asking ourselves, oh, what am I going to be in life? Um, you know, uh, is there something that I can contribute to the world, something that I can contribute to society? These are all things that we have, we have been programmed with. But the unrenewed mind, you know, if, if a believer is not renewing their mind, um, all these godly good desires and ambitions, they become fleshly. They become sinful in the sense the focus becomes me. The focus becomes the people that I want to please rather than just pleasing him. Uh, so um, 
what could have been a godly ambition turns into a uh, fleshly desire of the mind. So in that way, there are many, many fleshly desires of the mind. You know, um, uh, you know, jealousy, and then you have pride, and uh, you have greed, and um, I mean, these are all things that operate in the um, in the in the mind at the level of the of the unrenewed mind, which has not been brought into alignment with scripture. In the same way, there are fleshly desires of the body. To use a very simple example, we all have been programmed in our physical body to want to sleep, uh, you know. Uh, but then, you know, if I become lazy, like you know, Proverbs talks about the the sluggard who does not wish to, you know, um, put in hard work uh, and um, you know be responsible. So uh, something that God God has programmed as a as a means of rest, as a means of you know restoring your strength, that becomes a fleshly desire. Where you just want to keep lying there in the bed and don't really want to go about your responsibilities and do the things which God has called you to. So um, something that has been good, something that has been programmed into your body to do good, now becomes a fleshly desire where um, you know you are allowing that desire to go in the wrong directions. Um, it can be the same even with greed, you know. I mean, uh, um, physical greed. I mean, so um, we all have been programmed with a desire to eat. Uh, I mean, when we get hungry, we know that you know now it's time for us to feed our uh, bodies. So uh, that is a godly desire. Uh, but then uh, a person who becomes reckless, does not even care about what kind of food he is eating as long as it makes him happy, does not take care of uh, you know his body, uh, starts neglecting his uh, uh, health. Uh, now that turns into a, um, a, a ungodly fleshly desire where uh, all that matters to you is is making yourself feel happy you don't really care whether that is harming your body whether you know that will um, uh, affect uh, your future you know because the things that god wants for you if your health is uh, really lousy because of the wrong decisions you have taken you'll not be able to fulfill the purpose that god has for you so uh, when we say fleshly desires of the body and the unrenewed mind, um, we're talking about things that actually were meant to be good, but now we have um, um, are using these things for all the wrong purposes. We are we are we are we are, we are, uh, we are taking these desires of God, these ambitions of God, in all the wrong directions and fulfilling them for uh, for all the wrong selfish motives. You know, just to benefit ourselves. Uh, so. So temptations uh, in this area uh, can be a wide variety of things. Uh, but basically, one thing that we would see is that um, all of these desires are aimed at making me happy um, uh, or, or, or fulfilling what I want for myself rather than uh, what God wants, uh, rather than you know honoring God. So um, these things become evil desires of the body and mind. Uh, so this the scripture uh, that talks about how um, temptation uh, can hit us and how it works in this area of our lives. Uh, so in your notes, you would have James chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. So if we could have someone read out James 1, 13 to 16, please. Yeah, I mean, if any of the students are actually, you know, attending the class, uh, if um, I could have one of them read out James chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. It's just that if someone else reads the verse, it kind of gives me a chance to, you know, pause um, so that I don't have to speak continuously. So if anyone is present in the class, 
you know in today's uh, online session uh, james, if you could please yeah. james james james, 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 james one Yeah. yeah 13 to 16 yes yes 13 to 15 let no man say when is tempted i am tempted of god for god cannot be tempted with evil neither tempted he any man but every man is tempted when he is thrown away from his own lust and enticed then when the lust has conceived it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished we get for death yeah you know so over here it, with the first portion verse 14 it says uh, you know okay okay verse 13 verse 13 says it's god is the god never tempts so uh, we cannot say oh god has you know allowed these circumstances to come into my life uh, now see you know how how uh, circumstances have worked out um, everything has come together in such a way that now i am forced to tell a lie No, so we kind of pass the blame on to God and say, "See, if God had, you know, uh, allowed things to go differently, then I would there would be no need for me to lie." But look, look at the way God has permitted uh, things to um, come together in such an impossible manner that now the only option for me is to lie. So you know, in, in a sense, we actually are blaming God and saying, "Oh, God is the one who is, you know, forced me into this situation where I am having to commit a sin." so over here it says very plainly god does not tempt us to sin so we cannot uh, accuse god and say oh god has permitted these circumstances and now because of these circumstances i am forced to do something sinful no and there is always a righteous way of dealing with those um, you know uh, circumstances so we cannot use that excuse that god is tempting us Uh, but like uh, it says in verse fourteen, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. So you see, the reason I am responding wrongly to these set of circumstances that have come together is because of my uh, the way uh, this evil way of responding to these circumstances is because of the evil desires inside my heart, rather than standing up for what God wants. it would be more convenient for me if i can just you know sin in this particular uh, situation so it's my evil desire that is making me sin it's not uh, the circumstances themselves because circumstances can be dealt with uh, righteously circumstances can be dealt with uh, you know uh, deceitfully so uh, the it's my evil desire that is making me um, deal with these circumstances because who knows you know there was another believer you know and he was faced with the very same circumstances maybe he would stand, choose to stand up for righteousness no matter what's going to happen you know i will be righteous in regarding this matter is probably the stand that he would take on the other hand uh, you know uh, me i'm uh, allowing this evil desire uh, to have its way and i'm saying oh see i have no choice now i have to sin so that is my evil desire that is actually dragging me into into sin um not so much the situation itself um and uh, then it says when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed so what happens is this evil desire within me it entices me that word basically means you know um i'm being uh, tempted and kind of being drawn into um doing the sinful thing as in uh, my my will power is being weakened you know the same way the longer eve looked at that fruit um the more appealing this whole idea of rebelling against god was becoming so she was getting enticed her will power was getting weakened the longer she kept looking at that um, you know sinful act and she was thinking ah you know if i do this sinful thing then you know this is what i would gain from it so the, that that uh, that evil gain began to look more and more attractive so it is the evil desire which first you know um births in us um this inclination to go and do something sinful at that point itself if we were to cut it right at the root and say no 
this desire that I'm feeling now is not a godly desire. So I will not even go further. I will not even think about it. I will no longer even dwell upon it. You know, so um, cutting it off right at the very beginning. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so cu so cutting off the thing at the, at the very beginning, um, it kind of keeps it keeps the enticement stage from coming in. You see, because stage one is where the evil desire thinks, ha, ah, why not do this sinful bad thing? And the second stage is enticement. So if uh, Eve had immediately said, forget it. I mean, God said no, not to, you know, uh, you know, uh, not to eat the fruit. So I'm not even going to stand over here in front of the fruit and, you know, ponder on it. I'm just going to turn my back and walk away from you, Satan. OK, no, it is not Satan. It, it, yeah, the, it came in the form of a serpent. So I'm just going to turn my turn away from you, serpent. And I'm going to turn away from this uh, you know, fruit and walk away. So if, if she had done that immediately, the second stage of enticement would not even have happened. So the wisest thing that we can do is when an evil desire comes, um, the best thing to do is immediately to say, oh, this desire is not of God. Scripture is very clearly telling me what is right and what is wrong. And I can recognize the fact that this desire is wrong. It is sinful. So I choose to immediately turn my back on it and say no and walk away. So when we choose to do that, uh, the this, this second stage of enticement does not even come along. You know, so um, so if you stand over there and allow yourself to continue being enticed, you know, and, and that uh, option, the sinful option starts looking more and more attractive and uh, you, your mind starts filling with the thoughts of what you can gain by doing this sinful thing. So all that starts becoming very, very attractive because you're still standing over there and pondering the sinful option. When we do that, uh, this desire, it, you know, it, it conceives and gives birth to sin. So, um, um, so if you stand there long enough and ponder that option, um, you will reach a point where you will actually act it out. So you would actually give birth to this sinful deed, you know. And uh, if you continue doing this again and again, it, it, it you know it says in verse fifteen, and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. So. Um, uh, if you continue to live in this uh, uh, in this sinful lifestyle, you know, and you keep giving in this to this particular temptation again and again, it becomes full grown one day, and uh, it will lead to death and destruction um, uh, in your life. Now, uh, in some cases, it may even lead to physical death. You know, it depends on what kind of a you know sin we are indulging in. Uh, but in most cases, it, uh, when it says death over here, it's talking about you know spiritually how you're getting destroyed. How your you know life is um, being uh, completely messed up. So, so he says in verse sixteen. Uh, you know James says, "Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters." So when the when the end when the situation itself comes, don't say, "Ah, oh, see, look how God has permitted the circumstances to come around." Now, because of these circumstances, I have no choice. No, there is always a choice. You know. So, um, um, so uh, this is basically the uh, process. Uh, that this this particular temptation of the flesh, you know, goes through. Starts off with a situation uh, where it looks like the only thing that you can do is sin, which of course is not true because there is always the righteous option. When you go to God and say, "Lord, I want to deal with the situation righteously," you show me how. You know, so um, so uh, stage one, you choose to believe. That the righteous option is available, and God will show you how to deal with the situation righteously. Um, uh, second, so once that evil thought comes, you immediately say, "No, I will not even consider this wrong option. I turn my back on it. I choose to walk away." So when you do that, then um, it helps you to avoid this whole process of enticement, where that sinful option starts looking more and more attractive. So the next stage is if you stand over there long enough, uh, you will give birth to that sinful act. So best not to um, allow the enticement to happen. And uh, a person after giving birth to, the, to sin, if they continue to do this again and again, then 
that sinful thing in their life starts getting stronger and stronger it becomes full grown and it leads to destruction and death in their lives so james says don't even get into this whole process do not allow yourselves to be deceived you know is what he uh, says so having understood this whole uh, you know um, uh, background uh, regarding uh, the process involved in sins of the flesh you now we'll go on to look at um, other things uh, regarding um, you know fleshly sins uh, so romans 8 3 to 8 is um, is 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 a good scripture passage um it's i guess it's a, it's a lengthy passage um okay um uh, we 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 are kind of familiar with the first portion already you know romans 8 verses 3 and 4 we've talked about that before you know so uh, the law told us what is good the law told us what is holy so um we have a desire to do what is holy i mean people you know before salvation we we did have a desire to live a good godly life but uh, we were weak in the flesh uh, because we still had this uh, you know sinful spirit in us right that spiritually dead disconnected spirit which is not you know um, connected to the lord we were born with that sinful nature because we were in that pathetic condition even though we we wanted to follow the law we could not we were in that kind of a uh, position and so what did Jesus do? It says in Romans chapter 8, um, verse 3, that God decided to send Jesus Christ in the likeness of you know, us human beings. Um, so he sent us in that, uh, in that same helpless, uh, frail human condition so that this Jesus, what we failed to do, he would achieve. So he kept the law perfectly did not break it even once and by doing that you know we learned that he condemned sin in the flesh he declared to sin see sin i have not given in to you even once so you have no right over me you have no authority over me and uh, so uh, having declared that um, uh, now it be now because he was victorious in this all those now who choose to come under his covering who choose to come under his grace it says in verse 4 uh, romans 8 verse 4 that through you know the grace of jesus the righteous requirements of the law will now be met by jesus in us so he will enable us now to live righteously because in the same way he overcame when we choose to be united with him and abide in him he will impart that ability to us he will help us in each of our situations he will um, enable us to choose the righteous option rather than sinful option of dealing with that particular situation so he will make all of that happen and how will that happen it will happen to people who are choosing to live according to the spirit so if i'm going on listening to the to the cry of my body and the cry of my unrenewed mind uh, if i'm you know if i if i'm catering to those cries and those needs no i will not you know follow um, uh, the lord jesus on the other hand you know rather than listening to those uh, to those uh, you know uh, greedy cries of my unrenewed mind and flesh rather than doing that if i'm choosing to follow the gentle you know warning of the spirit where he's saying no don't there is another option there's a way that you can do this you know in a godly manner follow what i am saying you know if you're sensitive to him sensitive to um, to his leading if you're living according to the spirit then it says jesus christ will enable the righteous requirements of the law to be fully met in your life he will help you know so uh, then if no uh, then we have verses 5 to 8 uh, so if someone could read out please uh, romans 8 uh, 5 to 8 yeah Romans 8, 5 to 8, for the that are after the flesh, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit, for to be carnally minded is dead, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is entity and is enmity against God, but is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. 
So then they that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Yes, I mean, uh, so it says over here, we need to set our minds on what the spirit desires. That would be in verse 5, you know. Um, so those who have their minds set on what the spirit desires, they are able to live in victory. Because those who are not setting their minds on the things of the spirit, what happens? Their mind starts getting governed. Their mind starts getting controlled by the flesh that's verse 7 where it says the mind governed by the flesh so this is a mind um, which is getting governed and controlled by the flesh because each time the evil desires come along your mind is like oh, okay how can i cater to these you know desires of my mind and uh, body what can i do um, what loophole can i look for in the word of god so that i can actually do this thing i know it's supposed to be bad but if i could just find some loophole and do this thing you know so we we start thinking thinking in those terms, you're actually um, training and educating your mind to go down the wrong path. You know, so uh, you uh, so because you have your 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 thinking is towards doing the wrong thing and rebelling against God, your mind starts getting controlled and governed by the flesh rather than being controlled and governed by the Holy Spirit, because now you're, you know, actively uh, asking yourself, you know, how how can I fulfill these desires? And, uh, you know, you have no desire to actually honor God. So if that is the attitude, then that, that kind of a mind starts getting governed, starts getting controlled by the flesh. And the thing about such such a mind is that this kind of a mind starts getting increasingly hostile towards God I mean, um, this is something that, you know, uh, uh, we probably might have noticed in our lives, you know, um, at times when we are living in conscious sin and uh, we are choosing to ignore what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, uh, you know, when, when we are in that kind of a phase, going through that kind of a sinful uh, phase of rebellion, have you noticed um, you the things of God uh, don't interest you anymore and in fact you feel hostile uh, towards godly things I mean uh, you know this is something I remember uh, once and I was having a conversation with a person and uh, she was saying you know back in the days when um, she used to listen to a lot of um, um, wrong kind of music uh, uh, you know she, she say she, she was saying I actually used to feel anger and hostility when I would hear, you know, Christian worship music. I mean, there's nothing uh, in, in Christian worship music to make a person angry. It's it's the most harmless, you know, music there is. But she would say that, you know, whenever she would hear it, she would automatically feel anger rise up in her. So the thing about a mind which is controlled by the flesh is that it actually feels hostile towards the things of God. There, so uh, it is so dangerous to allow our minds to be governed by the fleshly desires, to be controlled by fleshly desires, because we start feeling more and more hostile towards the things of God. Uh, so it, it's a very dangerous, you know, uh, road to go to, to go down. And also, uh, it says those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God, because all the you know, more and more their mind starts wanting the wrong things so it becomes so difficult for them to please god you know so um uh, so we need to consciously on a daily basis set our mind on what the spirit desires and that's the only route uh, when we take that route then you know we start wanting to please him more uh, we start aligning our life uh, with with, with, with whatever uh, uh, would honor him. Uh, so um, if we, on the other hand, are being careless about what we are setting our mind upon, you know, um, we can get led away by all these, um, you know, uh, evil desires that we have within us. And um, uh, to use one example, okay, so um, let's take the example of the Corinthian believers. Uh, so we're we looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Uh, if someone could please read out 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verses 1 to 4. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. And I, brethren, 
will not speak unto you as unto the spiritual, but as unto as unto Cana, even as unto baby in Christ. I have fed you with meat, and not with meat, for it at all. Ye were not able to bear it, neither ye yet now are ye able, are ye able, for ye are yet Cana. For we are Christ among you, having and strife and division are yet not Cana, and work as men. Verse 5 one. Uh, well, you so, what verse 1? For four, what's four as well. For why one said, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollo, are you not Cana? Okay. Uh, so over here, I mean, uh, you know, in the NIV, uh, they, they, they're called worldly. That's the term that is used. So it's, 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 it's in fact used, you know, three times where these people are being called worldly. And uh, in verse three, in fact, it says, are you not acting like mere humans? You know, is, is, uh, is, is, the, is the term that is used. So um, the world thinks in a particular way. Okay, so uh, on the other hand, the people of God are supposed to think the way God thinks. Uh, so uh, there's a difference. So he say, he's basically saying, see, you're thinking the way the world thinks. Uh, you're, uh, and so you're acting like mere humans, is what he says in uh, verse 3. Uh, so the particular example over here, you know, in, in what way were they thinking the way the world thinks? The world basically wants to, uh, you know, establish, you know, uh, the people of the world want to establish their superiority over others. They want to show that, you know, I am better than you. Uh, what I have is better than you, uh, than what you have. My status is greater than your status. So, you know, that is one, uh, that's the way the world thinks. Okay. I mean, as far as this particular example is concerned. Uh, so over here, these people were actually doing that. It's like as if they were having this attitude of, you know, oh, I'm a follower of Paul. And Paul's teachings have, are, have solid meat. So I am a better believer uh, than you people who are, you know, listening to the teachings of Apollos. Apollo's teachings are not very good. So you guys are not very spiritual. So uh, it's ridiculous. So Paul says, you people are acting like people of the world. And he says, you're acting like mere humans. No, you're not supposed to be behaving like this. You're not even supposed to be thinking like this. You're supposed to be thinking the way God thinks. You know, so, um, uh, you know, so, so when we kind of um, make the same mistake, you know, it's so... Um, dangerous you know, because we all have this attitude sometimes we think oh my church is better than your church my denomination uh, is more uh, doctrinally correct than your denomination uh, so when we take this attitude uh, paul in fact you know would say to us he would say uh, you're behaving like uh, mere infants you have not even grown to a, a level uh, where you can acknowledge the fact that god is at work in all believers so uh, you know he says don't uh, go down the uh, you know road which the world goes down you know uh, exercising jealousy and quarreling and all of that don't be like that you know rather um, be th think the way god's people are supposed to think so um, here uh, how were the corinthians being fleshly in what way were they uh, giving into their fleshly desires? Uh, they were thinking the way the world thinks. Um, so whatever is important to the world, they were applying those same rules over here in the church. The world says, I need to prove my superiority. I need to prove that I'm better than you. So they were they brought that same worldly principle and you know thought pattern into the church. And there was, they were like trying to show off and say, oh, my, my leader is better than your leader. Uh, so I'm when it comes to spiritual walk, I, my my spiritual walk is superior, uh, you know, to yours. So all of this was going on, and uh, so Paul says, you need to stop being worldly. You need to stop thinking the way the world thinks. Instead, choose to, you know, uh, think in a way that, um, in the in the way that God would think. Okay, so that's just one example of how a person can be uh, fleshly. Another um, uh, verse. 
um okay um when when we look at first peter chapter 2 verse 11 uh, it says something important about uh, you know something you know uh, it gives us a warning about uh, fleshly living uh, so first peter chapter 2 verse 11 if someone could read out please Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 1 Peter 2.11. My mic was not working. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Uh, so it says over here that these sinful desires are waging a war against your soul. Okay, um, uh, so if a person is, is following sinful desires, uh, what is happening is they are fighting against their own soul. Uh, they are harming themselves. So um, they are defeating themselves, you know. So in that sense, they live self-defeated lives by attacking their own soul, by harming their own, uh, you know, interests, um, they are uh, defeating themselves. They are not giving themselves a chance to live in victory. So the really dangerous thing about uh, sinful desires and you know entertaining them and giving in to them, you are actually waging a war uh, not against somebody else. You're in fact waging a war against your very own soul. You're harming and destroying your your your, your very own life. You know. So um, this is the um, really serious danger, uh, which is why even Galatians six seven to eight. You know, also gives a very serious word of warning. Uh, Galatians 6, 7 to 8, if someone could read out. Can I read the lesson again? Galatians. Galatians 7 to 8. Be yes. not deceived. God is not mock. For whosoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8. For he that soweth to the flesh, to his flesh shall, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. Okay, so uh, here also very clearly it is said, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. You know, God has uh, laid down certain spiritual principles and that's exactly how things are going to turn out. So don't think that you can you know, do something sinful and get away with it. The spiritual principle that God has laid in place is that if a person... Uh, keeps sowing seeds which are catering to their fleshly desires, the crop which is going to come out of their life is not going to be a good one. So don't be under the, you know, it, it's it, it's like the same uh, uh, rule that, you know, works even in the natural realm. You know, if I go on sowing, um, you know, um, seeds of a mango tree and I keep telling myself, no, 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 I will get coconuts, I will get coconuts, it's ridiculous how much ever I may say to myself and try to convince myself that I'm going to get, you know, uh, reap a harvest of coconut trees. It's not going to happen because the seeds which I have been sowing are mango seeds. So um, in the same way, you know, coming to the spiritual realm, you know, it says over here, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. There are certain principles that God has laid in place and uh, the outcome will be on the basis of those principles. So if, if you have, uh, you know, as a believer, chosen to go on uh, reaping, uh, go on sowing seeds of rebellion, seeds of, uh, you know, uh, fulfilling your fleshly desires. If that's the path that you're going down, then um, uh, stop thinking that the outcome of your life will be good, that nothing bad will happen, that you'll somehow escape. No, uh, the, the, the spiritual principle that God has set in place will operate. 
and the harvest which comes out will be a one of destruction. So uh, because you are sowing seeds that are pleasing the flesh, it says the flesh will reap destruction. Um, so, um, uh, so both of these verses are warning us about the serious dangers involved in uh, entertaining a um, you know, a fleshly lifestyle where you are choosing to please the flesh and that is harmful. Um, now, uh, you know, in your notes, there are a few uh, practical points given on um, how to overcome the flesh. The very first point that is given about how to overcome the flesh, um, it says, know that you are free from the power of sin. Now, this is something that we've touched about, uh, touched upon again and again and again, because it fin it it all rests on this. If if I'm still thinking in my mind that I'm not really free from sin, I'll be I'll be like that person, you know, who says, "Oh, circumstances are all against me. I have no choice. I must sin in this situation." That's basically where you would end up uh, with that mindset. So it all begins with this basic knowledge of what was done for us on the cross. And we need to acknowledge the fact that, yes, we were set free from sin. So you know, we'll not really look at that in detail because we are so familiar with that concept you know, uh, by now. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, You know, again and again, we've talked about that because that is where it is so clearly put in simple language. It says over there that our old self was crucified with him. It's it's a plain fact. So that sinful, spiritually dead spirit that you and I were born with, that sinful nature that we were born with, it says very, very plainly that got crucified on the cross in that moment of salvation when we chose to submit ourselves you know, uh, to the Lord. So he did that for us. And it says so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So this is an established fact. So we need to accept that. And we need to accept the fact that the Holy Spirit has now birthed um, a new creation. We have been made into a completely new creation. It's not that he just took the that sinfully, sin, sinful, spiritually dead person and kind of repaired them a little bit. No, he totally replaced that. That old sinful me was crucified, done away with. And he in, in, you know, has now... Uh, turned me into a completely new creation. So I need, I'm no longer a slave to sin. Uh, so when the temptation comes, earlier when the, when, the, when the temptation would come, I really didn't have much of a choice. I would try to fight it. I would try to resist. But in the end, I would give in because I was helpless. I was a slave to sin. But now I need to recognize that no longer am I in that helpless situation. Now, actually, I do have the power of God to overcome that sin. Why? Because I am a new creation. So this is an established fact that we need to just absorb into our mind. Um, it's maybe the, it's probably one of the first things that we need to renew our mind about and make our mind clearly recognize the scriptural truth that we are no longer slaves to sin. So uh, it says in Romans you know, uh, 6, verse 14, For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Um, so you know we talked about this as well. We talked about how what is our legal standing now. Uh, we are not under the law. We are not being held under um, condemnation. Uh, but rather, we have now come under the grace of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, through his grace, he will fulfill the righteous requirements of the law in us because we are choosing every day to walk in the spirit, uh, you know, walk in step with the spirit, uh, listening to him, uh, trying to, you know, uh, live in a way that pleases him. So even as we are just doing that on a daily basis, Jesus Christ, because we are under his grace, he will fulfill the righteous requirements of the law in us. So, um, uh, so, so these are these things are uh, the very fundamental, uh, um, you know, scriptural basis, and we need to keep these things in mind on a daily basis. Uh, and another scripture, Second uh, Peter one three to four, says something so beautiful. Uh, if someone could read out Second Peter one three to four.
Second Peter chapter one verse three to four. By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him, the One who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because of His glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share His divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So it says over here. I'm see. This is a promise. This is God saying something. So we need to accept this as a fact. It says over here, His divine power has given us everything we need. Okay, so we were slaves of sin, but now our new status is this: we are by His divine power. We have been given everything we need for a godly life. So no matter how big the temptation is. Uh, no matter uh, how strong you know that thing which comes against you, that sinful um, you know uh, urge that comes over you, it doesn't matter how strong it is. God's divine power, His divine resurrection power, has now given us everything that we need for a godly life. And then in verse four, you know, he, he, um, Peter goes on to say he has that that Jesus has given us His very great and precious promises. So that through them you may participate. I cannot hear.
okay we'll take a break um uh, we'll come back from the break uh, so at 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 11 if we can all log back in you know we will uh, resume the class at 11 all right yeah thank you thank you